I'm talking to you about context, constraints, and convictions. Conte context, constraints, and conviction. The context is mine, my context. My life context and the constraints I feel with direct reg regard to the ministry of the word and the convictions about the handling of the word. With so august uh, a group of people, and that is not mere flattery by my standards, academically you uh, all excel me because the room is full of people with earned doctorates. I was referred to as Dr. Hayford and there are a number of reasons and they all hang on my wall with gratitude because they were conferred on me from respected institutions. But I have a, a deep regard for those who have given the time uh, the energy, the zeal, the scholarly pursuit to prepare yourself at the dimensions you have for the task that you serve, because of course is necessary to the role you fill today as professors. But that never was my target, and though I teach modules on occasion and um, guests at times to speak as a guest speaker, and you can get away from some of that with your accrediting agencies, I. Uh, I only have those earned, uh, those uh, conferred honorary doctorates that I hold. And I'm, I'm humbled by them and humbled to be referred uh, uh, as that by people that sometimes I think know that that's the degree of my academic preparation. And I wouldn't be offended if the term wasn't used of me. I've, I come to you as a longtime servant a pastoral servant, a shepherd. And I come as, uh, I have no idea how many sermons I've preached. I know that if you count the times I preached it, that for so many years I preached three or four times every Sunday morning, and sometimes on Saturday night as well, not to mention that we also had, all the years I pastored, Sunday evening services and midweek services, and I generally taught at those. That would be the case except for the months of July and August. And uh, I'm going to say something about when my breakaway took place then because I did consume of two weeks of that time in a study leave that was given towards something I'll share with you because it bears on what will be presented tomorrow. The, uh, by the way, there is a, a, a sh small sheaf of materials I think that you'll be, I don't know if they'll be given tonight or when they arrive tomorrow uh, that uh, you will take with you. Then I'll reference tomorrow. The heart that I feel for the word of God <laughs> can seem contrived that I begin to, to choke up here. And, and <laughs> that is not just an old man easily touched. It is a servant of the flock of God and a man passionate for the word of God and with a love for the word of God and for the flock. And with the, knowing the joy for so many years, 31 years in one pastorate, I pastored Anne and I pastored another four years and planted a church years before that and then I've served other positions within my fellowship of national youth leader at one time, president of our movement at another time, and then overlapping my pastorate was president of my alma mater, one of my two alma maters. I'm a graduate of APU, Azusa Pacific, I think you're all aware, nearby, and of uh, Life Pacific College. But uh, those are two bachelor's degrees and I was doing the second in preparation for pursuing a master's and then on further as a possibility, but the church began to grow so rapidly early on when I was at that time of my life that there wasn't time to continue with that educational pursuit. I had the good for fortune to uh, have good exposure to Greek studies in the uh, time of my first pastorate, not having taken any Greek by reason of the peculiarity of being a midterm entry, my schedule was always inconsistent with when the language classes were offered when I was in Bible college, but immediately on graduation, we pastored in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I attended Fort Wayne Bible College for three years and took three years of New Testament Greek. Those things uh, are the extent of my studies, but my passion in the word has had me there so that I have a pretty good familiarity with a, a lot of great, great teachers who exceed probably most of us in the room 
and they live in books on my shelves in my library. And I uh, am earnest and take the preparation of the word very seriously. As a, as a Pentecostal, uh, I realize that there are times people in our tradition uh, are known for sloppiness, not as though they are alone in the only tradition, because uh, hermeneutical casualness, and uh, I don't know if that's a term, but it works. Uh, you know what I mean, casual attitudes about hermeneutics, and uh, something less than a reasonably homiletical approach to your outline and presentation is common in much of the body of Christ and has little to do with tradition. But I know from experience, and I take no offense in this, I understand it, that uh, if you have a charismatic or Pentecostal orientation in your life and history and present, present experience, that you're always suspect in some circles. The fact that you have welcomed me, and I do feel that welcome, uh, is not surprising to me. There is a large yes in so much of the body of Christ and one that I've always sought to live out in my relationship toward the church. I refuse to be de 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 divided from anyone by my choice or from my side. As a matter of fact, I remember something that uh, <laughs> will, uh, I think, be of meaning to you because he's so renowned for, to all of us, but he's pastored for only, he pastored only three miles away from me for all the years I pastored at the church on the way. And John MacArthur's Grace Community Church and Church on the Way were three miles away and we both pastored beginning almost simultaneously in the valley and didn't know each other were there for about five years and both of our churches began to grow almost exactly the same. In fact, so many features of John's and my uh, experience in pastoral work uh, is so parallel except our tradition and uh, approach to doctrine and especially the ministry of the Holy Spirit being contemporary as I view it and many facets of it otherwise on his part. But uh, though I knew that when this happened, I discovered that this guy was there. And I also discovered I'm very happy about people that he perceived I being like, though I'd never had anything that I knew of said about me yet. But uh, <laughs> at any rate, I thought, I'm gonna get acquainted with this guy because we're too close to each other and God's doing too much in each of our churches not to do something. Most of you are familiar with this name that I'm about to announce because he was, I don't know if he's the founder, but he was the leader, and I think still is technically, though you don't hear as much of the Unification Church. But uh, I wrote John a letter and I opened it, and uh, be, be the letter by saying, Dear John, uh, first you must understand the awkwardness I feel in writing you, uh, because I feel that as soon as you saw the name on the envelope, that it seemed as though equivalent to if you were to receive a letter from uh, Sung, Myung Myun, Sung Myun Moon, and uh, the head of the Unification Church. He wrote me really a nice letter. I'd suggested we get together, have breakfast or something. Wrote me a nice letter and said, I'd, I think it's a great idea. No, I don't think you're like Sun Myung Moon. And, and uh, from that time, we developed a pretty good friendship. And uh, so John has been a friend. Uh, the, the degree of reserve he feels, so I have to share with you, and I say this because it does not, it doesn't offend me. It's amusing, I understand it. One day after we'd been having breakfast, we, did, we made a point of meeting every year for about 20 years. And we've not been together because both of our lives have taken new paths uh, to some degree. He still is pastoring Grace Community Church, but really it's filling the pulpit because his time has taken so much at Masters. But uh, at any rate, uh, I uh, wrote him, uh, he, he uh, we were at breakfast one day and uh, I said, John, listen, just tell me. I said, I'm not worried about this. Tell me how you really think of me. And uh, I don't think he would mind my saying these things that he said, though they're not said uh, for self-affirmation, but it did mean a lot. He said, well, Jack, he said, you're a man of God. You love the word of God. You're faithful to it. You're a man of character commitment to the church, you're consistent, and a credit to ministry. But Jack, you're just a little bit off. <laughs> 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 I 
And I laughed just like you're laughing, and he smiled. And uh, that uh, brings me to saying that in talking with you about spirit-led preaching, I'm going to do so not only by affirming its importance, which is obvious, I'm sure, to all of us. I don't think that has anything to do with sectarian people that know the truth of God's word, the life that is given to us by new birth in the spirit and the presence of the spirit in all of our lives, that uh, we, we, we care in feeding the flock about being led to feed in ways that will develop them will truly grow them, and we realize we need wisdom that exceeds ours. So I'm going to tell you a number of things, first about what prompted the way I go about what I do. Now I'm sure some of it I would have done anyway because I'm a pastor and a believer and I would pray, and I would seek the Lord. But the way I go about some of these things, which I am going to describe to you, and it's not for the sake of impressing you or attempting to impose a mode on you, but to describe things that reflect a passion and an environment in which I, uh, in my own way, having sought the Lord, discovered that he does do that. He does lead us in our preaching ministry. He does give direction. He does meet you midway in messages at times and bring things to your mind that you had not thought about to include in the message, but they're there. Perhaps born from another time of study, even in another passage, but it integrates with what you're saying now. And not because you're reaching for material, but you know that the way it comes, it is something that has what I call the touch of the Spirit upon it. That is something that to me has a sense of an inner witness, a certainty, that this is a prompt from him. Those are things that guide other pa times, and I think in each of our lives, times when we sense God is doing something. In some traditions, it's with difficulty, people will necessarily even admit that because they're not sure how they'll be responded to by their peers. It's not uncommon in sectors of the church, evangelical, that if you talk about God speaking to you, that it is taken with some great readiness to warn you of either who do you think you are or is the next thing you're going to do announce that you're going to add to the canon of scripture. There's a, a, a guardedness that was not in the evangelical community in the years that many of us in this room grew up. Most of you and perhaps all are younger than I. But uh, we still grew up singing songs like and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. I come to the garden and I meet the Lord there. I was so touched, by the way, by the worship time we were led in. Thank you, Barry. That was really beautiful. And please uh, tell those young women how, how impressed I was by both of their skills when that young soprano went up there and took uh, a, uh, an air of the melody that was other than the regular one and then drops back down into the, the uh, hymn tune. Uh, was just uh, beautifully done, uh, elegantly played by the flautist. It was just a thank you for, uh, thank them. I think probably for all of us and uh, thank you. The sensitivity of the time in prayer together. Those things are uh, all so reflective of, well, there's, uh, when we sang that first song with the lyric to the, uh, the older hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise and Light and Accessible, hid from our eyes, most gracious, most holy, the ancient of days, uh, most gracious, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. I just r resonated to that melody again, loved the lyric, which I'd never heard, like to get a copy, by the way. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll hold you, Barry, uh, obligated to that, and uh, you, can, you would have assigned him to do it anyway. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, but I'd never come across that. And it's, I, I come across him. So I have a collection of nearly 200 hymnals. And the, the oldest one goes back to the 1600s. And I have used hymns in my devotions regularly. A typical morning, and now I'm coming, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm into the message here saying this. <laughs> Early in the morning, uh, it's, uh, it's a half of the year, it'll be dark. 
and I'm in the front yard of our house. Uh, how it's laid out and how it is with proximity to other houses allows me to take this liberty. And I will stand there and sing and begin my worship and my devotions in the presence of the Lord. And it is uh, an awakening of my soul to the day, a worship of the Lord in preparation of myself to go and open the word and read my uh, present point of reading through the scriptures and then to go to my time of prayer. And this, uh, this approach has been uh, the fountainhead of many things of the Holy Spirit leading me all the years of my ministry. Because it's in those times that among other things, in fact, there are, there are 11 pillars across the front of our yard, most of them connected by a, a wrought iron fence, and then there's a gate for pedestrian entry, and then a gate that slides open when you want to, to get the car off the street. But uh, this is uh, about 120 or 30 feet across the front there, and I'm standing in front of the house, uh, shielded a bit from across the street by bushes that are there, and a large enough yard, and early enough in the morning, and I'm not thundering like a so profundo anyway. And as I, as I sing, just let it all <clears throat> hang out before the Lord of my love for him, my gratitude for his place in my life. The 11 pillars each are my prayer list. Also a number of things in the front yard and six trees are. They represent factors in my life. One, the one that's third from the right is coming in this way, but it's I start at the north and come toward the south. And that is the one that is the place where I pray for places I'm going to be speaking soon. And when you receive an invitation like this, it goes on the list and I begin to say, Lord, I don't want to just go with stuff I've got. I want to go with something you have. Now, I didn't have, well, perhaps you could say I had a lot of what I'm doing tonight because I've done this so long and discussing tuning to the Holy Spirit, really. I'm not here to tell you how to do it. I'm telling you the joy of doing it and what I think the price tag on it is. I've not gotten to that part yet. Uh, by the way, you, I, I am supposed to be done by 10.30, is it? <laughs> <clears throat> Seriously, I, I, uh, I know that you have to listen and expect to hear. God does speak to people. My personal persuasion is he speaks to everyone on earth. I think many of them don't know who's talking, but I think most of them do. I think that he says things to people and most people never say anything about it because they don't want to be accountable to it. They don't want anybody to know that happened. First, they'll think they're crazy because there's just enough people who say God spoke to them and do the most gosh awful things, sometimes murderous things, that it's not surprising that people might decide I never want to tell anybody I heard anything from God. But for those of us that are called to walk with him and lead his people in the path we learn in his presence, it seems to me it should be common because I think he does speak. I think he's spoken to most everybody in the room. I think that the way he impresses you and deals with you may not be with a verbal expression, but at the same time it becomes so clearly cast in verbs by verbal, in words, that you, you, you do have a sense of what he has for you. You can call it a witness in your spirit. You can call it peace on a matter or hesitation or reserve that exceeds something, especially when it's something you would be inclined to, but you feel cautioned not to do that. I'm not talking about things that might be evil or violent or something that would be unworthy of our behavior. I mean things that uh, you need to make a decision about. And then there are times that we uh, feel an impression, but it's something we really would like to decide yes and or no uh, but the impression very strongly is the other, and that's when we would beg off, but we really can't because it's so deeply impressed on us because God has spoken to us. The concept of the Lord leading us in our preaching, leading us to 
a text leading us by making something seem right. When the Council of Jerusalem drew their conclusions in Acts 15, they said it seemed right to us and to the Holy Spirit. What did they mean by the Holy Spirit? I don't know. It seems that they all had a common witness together and presumed that it was a harmony of the Holy Spirit in their hearts. But it said it seemed good to us. Well, it seemed good to me to be here, but a lot of times the seeming good has to do with a deeper impression than that when it comes to seeking the Lord and saying, Lord, lead me with regard to this series, lead me in regard to, Lord, as I take this passage of scripture. Let me tell you one of the things that I regularly do. And I, I do it like I'm going to, to uh, uh, show it to you, but first I want to explain why I, I, I do what I do. Uh, this is not a shtick. It's not anything I'm necessarily advising. I don't think you have to do this for something to happen that brings the fresh breath of heaven on the word when you come to study it. I do believe you need to seek for insight. That you need to seek beyond anything your study can reveal to you. A good deal of what I study is to confirm things that I felt as I study the text on my own. And if I have any question about the relative uh, correctness or worthiness or appropriateness, anything wondering about whether the text really does say this or am I imposing something on it, then that's when I will read some trusted, accomplished authors, many of whom you as well would utilize. My primary, most common resources are Lenski and Kyle and Dalich in the New and the Old Testament, Lutheran scholars. Uh, but uh, that's just a little bit of what occupies the library. They're just most commonly referenced in the first in the new and the first in the old, but others will back those up if I'm searching for something that I either want deeper insight in or that I want to verify what I feel and see if I can find anywhere in the, their commentaries and others uh, that there is, this is a worthy thought or if it's something I ought to discard, even though I kind of like the feel of it. And so there is uh, the seeking of the mind of the Lord and it comes that way, but it begins with my study. Years of my pastorate, Sunday night before I went to bed, I would go up to my office and I already knew from plans the preceding summer what, uh, where I would be at this time of the year and what I had laid out for the preaching calendar for the year. I uh, did that in the weeks I was away in the summertime. And uh, laying that calendar out did not confine me or mandate that I had to do everything that I'd laid out, but I probably did do about 90% of it and uh, built the, uh, the, the pattern of series I would use in order to uh, accomplish specific goals that I'll describe tomorrow and you'll have some material in hand about that. On Sunday night, knowing what I would be preaching on the following week, I'd go up, read the text, pull out some books, look up a couple of things, get ready to really start my study the next evening. On Monday, I would go up to the office and I would, would go into the original language and check keywords. One of the things I'll talk about tomorrow is my approach to, uh, to preaching that involves, uh, because I'm gonna talk about uh, pre preaching, which and of course the, the approach, the homiletics and the hermeneutics of it <coughs> tomorrow, but tonight, I want to affirm and discuss hearing uh, the voice of the Lord and being led by the Holy Spirit. But when I came to the, the text, I would open to where the text would be this week, and I would lay my head on my Bible on my desk, and uh, I hope this will offend no one when I would say I would begin to pray in the Spirit. Uh, for me, as you would guess, that means speaking in another language, it is not uh, repetitious, it's a, it's a rather fluent flow of language that I experience. It's not some kind of da-da-da-da-da and just say it real fast and now you're full of the Holy Ghost kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking about, among other reasons, why Paul probably said, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. I don't think he was being condescending to the Corinthians. I think that he was expressing something that was of value in his own life. It would take him to discuss why, or to describe why. For me, it has to do with the belief that what I am doing is interfacing with the one who breathed this book. 
and I am over it, breathing onto it myself, and every time I breathe, I have to inhale. And as I pray in the Spirit, my prayer really is somehow, Lord, you who long ago, not on this printed page, but upon someone with a pen and with a parchment or with some animal skin began to write as they were being borne along by your Holy Spirit. And you breathed on a parchment. You breathed on a skin. Your word. And it was worshipfully and faithfully transmitted from generation to generation. And I hold this present language of it in my hands. But it's essentially the words that you breathed a long time ago. And as I come over them and worship and seek your face, I ask you, Lord, let me breathe in what you breathed on. I want that life in what I'm going to give these people next week. It is not enough that I be a good expositor. It is not enough that I'm accurate in my interpretations. It's not enough that I speak with, ling with language skills and with some linguistic readiness to look at other resources to help me be closer to precisely the way it was put at another time and how that may flavor the way it appears in my Bible. But Lord, I want the life that's in it. I want the breath that's in it. And I want you to give that to me and lead me in my study this week in this text. I began feeling that early in my ministry. I want to tell you how that happened and what it affected of something I will share with you as I do begin to draw toward, toward a conclusion. It's not going to be quick, but it's coming. <laughs> I found that it comforts people when you let them know that. <clears throat> I began to long and desire to preach the living word, the breath of the word, for it to somehow infuse me and my preaching. And I believe that frankly, the Holy Spirit's presence in any one of our lives can be invited to do that very thing. I don't believe that this has to do with what church or tradition you are or what your experience it is. But my brothers and welcome sisters that are here tonight as well, I will tell you that my prayer to God is that whatever things there are that in the body of Christ bring a reticence or an arrogance on anyone's part to openly talk about a passion to breathe of the Holy Spirit, to be filled so that it overflows you and when you speak, life comes out. The immediate life of his voice. I didn't specify a supernatural language, I didn't intend to. But that when we speak in this language, the one we address those that we minister to in, that when we do, that it comes out the living voice of the Spirit happening through a vessel in whom he is incarnating the living word. I don't mean another Christ, and you know that. I mean that there is a human vessel through whom the word is being transmitted and it's coming forth with life. I only feel caution about the verbiage I use in those regards because I feel that you're always at risk where we have people of expert analysis and capabilities and various orientations in how they view uh, anything other than uh, traditions that are acceptable to them. And I don't feel that particular caution for any reason of rejection sensed in the room. 
but I do know that I can, I'm at risk of saying some word in talking about the Holy Spirit and the nature of his intimate workings in and through us and our capacity to tap those things on the, his glory for his purpose and not for anything that is self-serving and certainly not for anything that is to make a foolish display. But for the sake of the vital life of the living God, the truth coming through us, transcending the gifts of our intellect, not because we're speaking things we don't know, but because we're seeking, speaking them with a life-giving power that we came to know about in our study, but as we opened up in receiving his leading and a live quickening in our preaching begins to come forth in a way that we ourselves recognize is transcending the usual us. Most of you are not a stranger to that experience already. It may not be all the time, but we've all experienced it. You've experienced the times where you're speaking and you know that there is something that is attending what you are saying with the words you're speaking that is coming through better than you. You walk away saying, that was great, that's better than, than I can do it. It's not because you didn't work at it. Not talking about being slothful, saying, well, I'll just wait on God, the Holy Spirit will do it, and I'll slack off on studies. Not talking about anything so stupid as that. That would be an insult to God, an insult to our callings. I'm talking about a passion for the Spirit's presence. I uh, was invited as one of the speakers to do two of the workshops in the Congress on Biblical Exposition that took place, oh, it must be 15 years ago anyway, uh, here in Southern California, but there were about 3,000 from all over the nation. And it was an honor to be asked to do, even do a couple of workshops in it. And there was probably a couple hundred, hundred people in each workshop, but 3,000 at the conference. In that uh, occasion, I, I related what I'm going to now and uh, had questions raised uh, by a sincere young man who was preparing for ministry. And I think he'd started to pastor, but was still finishing graduate studies. And uh, he was highly critical. He, he was uh, not unkind. It was, he was, it was uh, he, but he was just challenging. And it had an inquiry to it, but it was an inquiry that had made up its mind. He, uh, he, he didn't really want to, to know uh, other answer than what he'd already concluded, but he wanted me to know that he did uh, listen, and uh, he was not unkind, but he was very direct, and it had to do with this paradigm that I'm going to describe. I, I very much live by and believe this. I'm going to talk to you about uh, an example of the living word being transmitted through a human vessel. And uh, I want to begin by describing a book that got me in this direction. I didn't hear it said this way, but it's what got me to where I started thinking further about the matter. The book was written by a Scottish Presbyterian preacher about 192 or three, somewhere like that. I don't, in, in the, uh, I checked the book the other day, I think it's, uh, 1907, I think it was. The, the man's name was Ian McPherson. I don't know anything about him other than the fact that he published a book. It was a respected press of, of that date. Uh, many of us who have books that span the last century or more uh, in our books in our library or uh, certain publishers have put out the kind of stuff we're interested in as evangelicals and uh, you run across names often enough to know, and this was been in one of the respected publishers of the time. I don't recall which. And uh, Ian McPherson had written this book entitled The Burden of the Lord. And he talks about the burden of the Lord in the, using the term the way the prophets did as something that is that cons inescapable constraint that deep within draws you and, and demands that you, you bring a message from God. And uh, 
he described it in other ways, and in it began to talk about the birth of Jesus, the birth of the Word, this is the first sermon, the Word was made, the first sermon was made flesh, the, the word sermo in the Latin uh, meaning word. In the beginning was the sermo, the sermon, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The sermon became flesh. And he talked about, he said, I thought it was just so poetic, but so beautiful, and, uh, and it truly did happen. He said, every sermon, he said, it's a worthy wish, every sermon should be a Bethlehem, he said, where the light of God shines down and the word appears to the heart and eyes of people there. And this, he's referencing, of course, the Savior. He says, when wise men come and the intellectual come to seek the word and when common ones such as the shepherds also kneel in his presence he said every sermon should be a Bethlehem a beautiful statement it was out of that that I later began to think about Mary and it occurred to me that if anyone ever delivered the sermo, she did. The word was transmitted through her body to the world. Redemptive, the redemptive operations of God, frankly, I think are modeled in what happened to Mary. You can decide if this is valid on your own part, but since a sermon is a redemptive operation, by operation I mean the same way you talk about anything that's a strategically exercised purpose to achieve an effective end of something worthy, as an operation that's in, in effect. All God's redemptive works, I think, begin with someone who he touches and moves their heart causes them to, to do something at his direction. Mary has a visitation from the Lord. An angel that comes from the throne of God, a messenger from heaven. That's what he says is in the scripture, so you can say it's in the Bible, but it hadn't been put in the Bible at that time. But Gabriel comes and greets her, and in greeting her says he has a word from God and so the word of the, from the throne of God came to this woman. She's startled by it. She can't con imagine this. She can't conceive of it because it involves conception. It involves a conception that seems out of reach to her. And if she violates anything that would have an alternative way of pregnancy that she knew, then it would be something that would uh, certainly break the troth between she and Joseph, beside the fact that she was a godly woman. The virgin hears the word and startled by it, puzzled by it, but understanding its significance that this has to do with the rule of the throne of David, the promised Messiah, she may have known Isaiah 7:14 at least by reference, not but not by textual reference, but by the fact that people may have talked about it. I don't know. But at any rate, she's, it's incredible to her that she's being told that the, if you will, the kingdom is going to come through her. It's going to come in the form of a baby. She's not that that much, but it's going to come through her. When we talk about thy kingdom come, thy will be done, I'm not talking about some bizarre doctrinal uh, adaptation that sometimes flashes on the horizon with idiot notions that people have, but uh, the reality of the presence of the king and what he can do and how his rule in a human heart transforms things. I think it's the very thing, in fact, what we want to be in our church and in our people and to happen in their homes and their families, that the kingdom come there and God's will be done. And those things shape 
and refine and are brought about in the lives of the people we preach to, those are brought about when the living word comes to them and something begins to happen more than the, what they've learned. It becomes life and breath inside them. There's a heartbeat to it, like there would have been of the baby that begins to develop within Mary's womb. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. There's a, one or two more things I want to say about that, but before I do, I want to, to note that when Mary says, how can these, those things be? How can these things be? The angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. You want to know how to be led for the life that God wants to convey the truth to introduce to the people you lead? The Mary miracle has some pictures that say it happened and that started the whole ball rolling then. The whole plan of salvation hinges on what happened in her. They weren't, God wasn't dependent on her if she refused, but she didn't, she received. And what she received was beyond her sense of inability. And dear brother and sister, I don't think I need to press this point with you. But if I ever feel adequate, adequate in myself, God, take me to glory. Our sufficiency is of God who has made us able ministers of the new covenant. Our sufficiency is of God. And how easily, how easily are my capacities and skills and experience how easily those can become a uh, sincere, but rather formal and formulated exercise with which I can turn out sermons at will. I can fulfill my obligation and do it gladly and do it thanking the Lord for the privilege of doing it. Just the way I can thank the Lord, I have a beautiful lawn or a rose garden and uh, I have a gardener to mow the lawn and I enjoy working the roses. Not speaking for myself and as the rose worker in our yard. But uh, those, those are things that, that we, you know, I enjoy what I do. You do too. You enjoy preaching. You enjoy preparing. You enjoy study. But that enjoyment can become something that I, it becomes what I do. Chuck Swindoll's uh, and I became somewhat acquainted during the Promise Keepers years where both of us often spoke at conferences uh, simultaneously and sometimes even had occasion we were on the same flight and visited. We both pastored within miles of each other. Chuck visited our church a couple of times with his staff and our staff meeting just to talk about different ways we did different things. So I've had a, something of a friendship with him. I wouldn't call it intimate at all, but a good friendship mutual respect, same like with John. And uh, Chuck, uh, recently I heard that he said, I didn't, uh, I didn't read it and I didn't hear him speak it personally, but someone had said it and it just stuck with me so much. Chuck said the most dangerous thing about ministering, the most dangerous thing about preaching is you can learn to do it. You can learn to do it. So that you can do it and not realize you're not depending upon the only one who can bring the power that was first breathed into the book to where it courses through your veins, through your spirit, and you sense it while you're studying. And it becomes not just exciting academic discoveries, it becomes life. And when you speak it, it moves in to the hearts of people. And the amazing thing to me from a lot of years of pastoring is how much 
more they remember it, how much more profound it is to them in year follows year, not necessarily every sermon, but across the congregation, if it's happening virtually every week, the ones that the Lord essentially wants to get a hold of at certain points in their life and that he'll see that it lands where it needs to, but when it lands, it needs to be more than cranial. And really, frankly, almost more than heartfelt at the moment, but flowed like a river stream of the Spirit of God into their spirit, where it becomes a fixture, an inescapable, not just truth, an inescapable presence of life. Now their life. Interestingly, their life delivered through an earthly vessel. Their life, which in this in this physical body, this human carnate body, not carnal in the sense that we think of sin, but flesh, through flesh, that life transmitted. The brain was active. The lips were equipped and trained. But something more than, than you can generate in a study, something that comes from being in the presence of the Lord and saying, Holy Spirit, be it unto me according to your word. According to your word. That has been the compelling passion of my pastoral teaching ministry almost all the years of my ministry. I read that book after I was in the ministry about three or four years, and it set in motion some thoughts. It didn't all happen at once. I wrote a little book some years ago. It's uh, called The Christmas, The, the Merry Miracle. The publisher, uh, it, it sold pretty well. The publisher did a Christmas edition and uh, called it, uh, we called it the, the same thing, The Merry Miracle. But it had to do with God's ways of redemptive entry. That any time he wants to achieve something redemptive, he'll give a word to somebody. It could be a word they heard you preach because of something that had become alive in you, it transmitted to them. The Holy Spirit took it and it stuck. And they couldn't get away from it. And so it activated something they gave themselves to because of that and redemptive activity took place by reason of that. The analogy, the paradigm of the Mary miracle is something that I've sometimes said to pastors that I, I really feel like uh, tongue in cheek that I say, Lord, every year I pastor, I wanna get pregnant every week and I want to deliver on Sunday. The more realistic way is that if you lay out uh, where you're going for a season of time ahead, you can begin to find him fashioning together. And that doesn't necessarily mean babies need sermons need to take nine months to uh, come to uh, readiness for delivery, but it, it does mean that sometimes they germinate and they're embryonic, sometimes for years. I've had things that just kind of hung in there and then the day comes that it bursts out and it's alive. The uh, experience of seeking the Spirit's leading, I'm going to conclude by just reading just something from what I have, uh, have written and uh, you will receive another occasion and uh, it had to do with uh, the possibility of this proposition. The possibility of this proposition that the living word, something of Christ himself, 
who said, search the scriptures, he said, I'm everywhere in there. Incidentally, you probably already have seen it, it's uh, their renowned authors, and uh, the, uh, what Leonard Sweet and uh, uh, Frank Viola have given us in that most recent volume on Jesus, a theography. Just if you read it, the opening part on the study, uh, the, the, the efforts they made to legitimize their uh, hermeneutic in the way that they utilize the, the scriptures in defining Jesus and uh, reach back into the Old Testament for a good bit of what they, they say as well. But uh, the title of the book, Jesus, a, Theocra a, a, a Theography. In other words, a biogra biography of God. And uh, you're doubtless aware of it. And if not, I would, I, 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 there's not any book I'd recommend. I, that book, I believe, is going to be around 100 years from now if, if the rest of us are. And I don't mean, uh, if human beings are is what I mean. I recently concluded a seminar with a group of pastors and the, uh, the business office of the school had to settle with them uh, right after I got done. And I, I said, now, Dr. So-and-so is going to be here to talk with you for a moment. But uh, I'd been with them for three consecutive days. And I said, so now I'm going to disappear. And somebody started, a couple started laughing when I said, I'm going to disappear. And uh, I was gathering my things up and I said, Dr. You'll, you'll take, take care of things now. And I said, well, you know what I meant. I said to saying disappearing, but I will tell you this, that if I do disappear, you better hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm about to disappear, but I want to read this. The possibility of such a proposition that you and I may receive direct counsel and didactic assistance to handle the eternal word of the scriptures given from heaven and declare it with life-transforming effectiveness is a stunning thought, but it's a viable option. The practical steps that open to that possibility are demanding, but not because they're difficult. The difficulty for us is that God's ways are not formed by the frameworks of human wisdom and learning. They're forged into the soul by the fire of the Holy Spirit. The fire is not a style of delivery not a shout of exuberance, not a show of intellect, not a sign from heaven. It's realized in the smelter of God's burning presence where he processes the melting of a man or a woman. It is the essential process by which he shapes vessels fit for the master's use. It is the ease with which we may shape our own image that makes it difficult to be led of the spirit the quickness of our minds, the presuming of our perceptions, the fixations of our private mindset, or the willfulness of our own ways. These are the difficulties and they do not readily yield. The pathway to the possibility is not paved with clever ideas or sparkling impulses. It is demanding not because it requires great intelligence or mystical, uh, mystical practices, but simply because it calls us to draw near unto God, the Holy Spirit. That fact alone forces us from dependence upon our own resource, our skill, our training, and our confidence in systems we have formed to assure our comfort that we can get this job done because we know how. To be renewed in the basic reality of the glory of our calling requires a fresh vision of the awe-inspiring privilege of being made stewards of the manifold grace of God, and thus be directed. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. This, I don't want to take time to elaborate. I may pick up on this in the morning, but I, I, I was driven to an extended word study on that word oracles, because it sounds always mystic because in the ancient world, the Delphi, the Greek oracle and so forth. Uh, and how did that, this, this term apply here? And it's really quite moving, but the essence of it I'll say because I want to be sure I get this point if I don't remember to do what I just said. But the obvious intention of it is to reference something, I will say this much, that the idea of oracle goes back to the place where there were in ancient temples the maintaining of the wealth of that temple. So that what God is saying is, as oracles of his, it involves utterance. That's the way the word is used, as utterance. 
as ones who bring the utterance of God. What the, for example, the Oracle of Delphi, the in ancient, Greek, ancient Greek culture, presumably had a wealth of was wisdom from the gods. What we have in this book is precisely that, wisdom not from the gods, but from God. The word of his wisdom, the word of his truth, the word of his power, the word of his instructions and guidance and how to live. To speak as those, and the oracles, and the usage it is in the New Testament, are the ones who manage the distribution of the wealth that is at that point in the central part of the temple. That's where we stand. Our privilege is to distribute the wealth, the riches that are mined in this book, and far not just to come out sparkling diamonds, but to come out things that we with them have been melted in order that it may be easily poured into people and they can receive it because it's being poured into us, not simply as information, but as an incarnation of the life of the word coming out as we stand there and that life transmits. I will uh, welcome questions in these regards, I think tomorrow and uh, anything that I've said, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm not easily offended in an environment like this. In fact, any question is an honor. It means they listen enough to at least critique or to inquire something. So please count on that. I want to conclude by saying uh, one more thing, reading one more thing. What I've described to hear and be led by the Spirit is far more than preach this text, develop this topic, do it on this day. That counts because there are times he will say that too. He may interrupt us at times and say, you don't have a bad idea here, but this is not the message. May interrupt the flow of what you feel you're doing, but I've got something else for you to do. Not something born out of mere impulse, not something born out of some irritation, anger, or chance to jibe somebody back with your latest insight on how to get even. Uh, but they, excuse me for that, that's not even a nice thing to say. That's not an accusation. Uh, the cost we're talking about, this costs, is, uh, this costs a reassessment and renewal of my values. That is opening to having the word born in you and conceiving it by the breath of the Spirit from the book and delivering it just as Mary delivered the baby so that Jesus comes out and when his life gets in them, the transmission from the letter of the word becomes the word happening in people, the living word Jesus. That's our summons. The cost, I believe, of that kind of thing happening in us does cost a reassessment, renewal of my values, and I possibly even require repentance, a change of my mindset that renews and returns me to the simplicity that is in Christ. That was another word study I pursued. That word simplicity uh, essentially has to do with an app, we would use terminology today of there being an absolute and total transparency, that there is nothing hidden, that, there's, that I, I, I come with open faced before the word, as uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 describes, we with open face behold as in a glass the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. And that in that openness in us, then it, it transmits, transmits. When Paul talks about that his own speaking to the Corinthians, that he's speaking openly to them and forthrightly, He's talking as a father to children. He's talking with his heart hanging out, and it had been walked on. And as he comes, there is, it's not a matter of the slightest thing that is, relates to a profession. It's a, it is a calling, but transcends a calling. It has to do with such a, an embrace of a walk and an anointing that you cannot escape, that it is your life, and your life is to receive of of the life that's in this book and to relay it to people and that other than the life happening, the, the form uh, it never satisfies then because you've, 
unless the life happens and the form doesn't satisfy any more of that. The assignment uh, that we, we have calls us to pursue him. There's two or three more paragraphs here I was going to read, but I don't think I will. Uh, it's time to conclude and probably past time. You've been very gracious, and I uh, say that not because you didn't leave, because uh, you, you wouldn't have done that just out of general courtesy. But my sense of your uh, receiving me and openness to hear me out uh, means so very much. And my sense of uh, peace that the Lord's uh, word is something that is uh, coming forth with clarity that I would hope. Um, what I've described, I hope, has uh, make some point that isn't something so obvious and redundant that uh, you say, what in the world did he say and why did he say that? Because we already knew that. I'm not saying things so much that we don't know anyway, as though I thought you didn't. I'm talking about things to uh, deal essentially with the igniting of passion, because that's the thing that constantly can elude us out of just habit. And especially people that are scholars, I value scholarship. I don't have any credentials to verify it at any degree of advanced accomplishment. But I tell you that I have been in the books and I have stirred the, the dregs of the word study resources and prayed over them and sought the things that the Bible has to say in many places that exceed anything of the text that is of necessity needs to be studied today. I am not an accomplished scholar. I am a very serious student of the Bible. And so uh, at that same time, I'm a very happy pastor and preacher and very happy to be one invited to be with you. God bless you. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.